Hi, I'm Dr. Mary Ann Pinkston, and this is The Better Life with Dr. Pinkston. And today, as always, I have a fantastic guest ahead for you. I have Dr. Terry Fox from the Boulder Holistic Medicine, so up in Boulder, Colorado, where she has been working with mold patients, Lyme patients, uh, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, I know is uh, near and dear to my heart because I have it. And I've brought you guys several shows uh, regarding mold and uh, its therapies and treatments. But Terry, is, Dr. Fox is going to bring us a new light today, and I welcome you in, Dr. Fox. Thank you so much. We have a mutual friend, Ray Solano, up in Cedar Park. So, Solano and Jill Carnahan, too. Yes, Jill Carnahan, who was on recently. I, I did not know that you had SIRS or mold toxicity. I did not. I did not reveal that to you, did I? Yeah. It's, no. It's taken me about 16 years to figure that out, of course, because that's usually what it takes people, you know, in order to figure out what they have. And most people have to self-diagnose. They don't have a great, you know, physician who understands and knows a lot about it. I am certainly learning, even though I've had this for some time and been suspicious of it. But anyway, I'm, I'm glad to have you on. Maybe you can clarify for our audience, um, you know, kind of how to get it diagnosed. What, you know, people, I think, wonder, have, they have a lot of mystery illnesses. They go to their physicians. They get blown off fairly frequently because I don't think a lot of physicians know and understand it. But how does somebody even, even get started on their journey? Well, you know, there's a couple different ways. Sometimes they'll come in and they <clears throat> already know that they have mold or Lyme. And so they're, you know, just looking for somebody who knows how to do it. Right. But there's a lot of, um, you know, in a, in your two hour intake, there's a lot of clues. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, you know, the trash can diagnoses like IBS and chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia yes. that are all like, names for things that don't mean anything or have any cause <laughs> or right. have any treatment. So those tend to be what, you know, we in functional medicine all were responsible for finding the actual cause. Right. And so there's certain, you know, just patterns that'll show up on the intake as far as like symptoms and things that will make mold more suspicious. And then we just do a test if that's what, um, you know, if that's what we're concerned about. Exactly. So, well, and then what kind of testing? I think, you know, patients often will look for ways of testing themselves. And so if somebody comes to you, which they can, and I want people to know that they can come and seek care through through you, what kind of testing do you do? So my favorite is the real-time labs. I do, um, and it's, so real-time has, uh, they're all mycotoxin testing. The stuff that I do is the urinary mycotoxin. I'll sometimes do the biomarkers in the blood that you might have heard of from, you know, the C4A and MMP9, but mostly I do a urinary mycotoxin. If they can come into the office, then I do a provocation um, of phosphatidylcholine and glutathione and an IV. And then um, we wait an hour and then we get the urine sample because the glutathione and the phosphatidylcholine will help bring it out mm -hmm. into the urine so we can see what's in the body. And the reason I do that is because the people that get sick are usually the ones that can't detox it. They can't metabolize it. And so it stays in the system and that's why they get so sick from it. So if you just do a urine on them, you may not catch much because if they were detoxing it, they wouldn't end up in my office. Right. Um, and so that particular test is just um, very specific, meaning very low false positives, but less sensitive. It'll miss some. And that's why I do the provocation. Um, and then I also like if they can't come in for the IV, I like Vibrant. Um, they do a good mycotoxin panel as well. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so those would be the two I would recommend. Yeah, awesome. So if, you know, if tested positive and, and it, they can do this uh, apart from you outside, like if they could come through my office, I know people here in, in uh, Texas are always looking for doctors here. And if I can do testing for you, is that something then they could, you know, schedule in and, and see you for and... Yeah, absolutely. That's wonderful. Do you do, well, except, you know, the out-of-state thing yeah. can be a little bit I know. That, and a lot is changing. You know, telemedicine has been so free and so open since COVID, and things are changing quite a bit. So a lot yeah. of new laws that we're getting used to. And and so... Uh, it kind of felt like a free-for-all for a little while. It was, there. right? And yeah. it was actually kind of nice. Right. Like <laughs> I know there's some, just a lot of a lot of clinics and doctors who probably took a lot of, took advantage of a lot of people with that, but I think it really made it... Uh, that was so nice, because... I could treat people all over, right. but, um, but yeah, so it's a little, you know, it's something that we can work with and sometimes we can, sometimes we can't, but right. being at a 
But yeah, absolutely. You could do the testing there. Do you do IVs in your clinic? I don't. I don't. But I have I have folks who are around me that could help me with that. It wouldn't be hard to do. Oh, yeah. So that, oh, that cool. could be done. Yeah. So, so if, you could do uh, either. Yeah, absolutely. And then if uh, so, if somebody is seeking treatment, they have gone through their checklist to, you know, um, to decide that they have this this illness. What what should they look for as far as getting, you know, getting treated? It sounds like a very long process, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, testing their home, trying to figure out if they're, you know, where the source is, if it's coming from home or work or, you know, how does somebody navigate all of that and get started? Yeah, so ideally you find somebody who does mold or biotoxin illness. Um, You can start with a functional medicine doc, but functional medicine, like a a few of them know the mold and Lyme biotoxin world, but not all of them do. So probably the best place to go is to ICI. Are you familiar with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the International Society of Environmentally Acquired Illness. Which you helped found, I think. Is this right? Mm Mm-hmm. Uh huh. And um, they have a list of providers. So there's, you know, ideally you can find somebody, you know, in your state or nearby. But I would find, you know, somebody who can guide you because it's it's fairly complicated. What 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 I like to say is it's um, I really like it as a diagnosis. So when somebody comes to me with complex chronic illness and, you know, they're half bedridden and they've got migraines and they've got, you know, all the all of it. Um, When it turns out to be mold, I love it as a diagnosis because it's really treatable and it's really reversible and people do so well. And it's it's much easier than like Lyme, for example, where it's a longer road and you might feel worse before you feel better and, and all that. So, if you're not being exposed, if it was a previous exposure and you do that mycotoxin test and we know which mycotoxins we're dealing with, then people will tend to have a decent turnaround in two weeks on binders, on the right binders. And then they tend to have another big turnaround when we get into phase two, which is antifungals and biofilm. Right. Um, so it takes a long time, but it doesn't take a long time to feel better. Like you still have to keep doing it, but you know, you start improving fairly quickly. Um, and then the, the other side, the not as fun side is if you are being currently exposed yeah. and it's, and it's in your house and then it, then it's, you know, a financial nightmare. And Absolutely. a bit of a nightmare. Yeah. It, not only yeah. that, I think uh, uh, somebody told me to be very cautious about talking to insurance about it because once you tag a home, you know, it has mold that it, that house becomes unsellable. It may be unsurable right. at some point. So it's something I think people have to do um, out of their own dime. And that is tough, but, but it's also hard to find people who will actually test for the right type of molds. I know we had somebody come in and just take a look at the vents and I'm said, you know, I think it's really in the water damage that we had years ago in the in the um, you know the structure of the home, and we couldn't get them to test. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know what we were looking for. And also with actinomyces, a whole other show, I'm sure. But, you know, to take a look at those features and try to test. So it's hard to find somebody to test, treat and, you know, help you pay for what you yeah. have to go so, um, so on that same website on ICI, there's a whole list of indoor environmental professionals. Wonderful. Um, so that are vetted by, you know, our organization. And so ideally you can find somebody, an indoor environmental professional to help you with your house that does a full house evaluation wow. um, and then can guide what needs to happen as far as demo, remediation, small, fine particulate cleanup. Um, but one thing you can do, like if you're at the very beginning and you haven't found your team and your people yet, Mm -hmm. and you just want to know, is it in my current home or not? It's not a perfect test, but you can do an ERMI, a QPCR test, Mm -hmm. which is just like that, um, a little like Swiffer, a little cloth that you wipe and get dust samples. And it's not definitive and it's not going to tell you if it's alive and blossoming and, you know, sporulating or where it is. But if, if there's ever been a big issue in the house, it'll show up enough and then you go okay so i probably should get somebody in um but if it looks pretty clean on the army then i wouldn't worry too much and i would have probably assume it's a previous previous. exposure interesting is this something that is maybe quite a question but is this something that is passed could be passed like lyme is uh through the placenta in your uterine 
<clears throat> Unfortunately, um, I think that we do believe that mycotoxins cross the placenta and they also, we know for sure they cross the, um, or they go into the breast milk. Yeah. Um, which is really sad. And oh my gosh. I know, right? So, Just don't even think about it. There's a reason why I asked <laughs> that to you. And I know that's kind of an off question. I kind of threw at you. I apologize. But, um, you know, the, my daughter and I both have the illness. And so you know, I want to point out to people for a physician, a func- functional physician who's felt like she's had something like this for such a long time and just newly diagnosed, what little I know about all of this is so unfair because patients, I mean, I'm a physician, right? Functional physician. Now you would think that I would have access to the most amazing amount of information um, and therapies. And I've been alone on this journey. And so since entering into functional medicine and, and, you know, meeting people like, like Ray Solano and then, uh, um, you know, Jill Carnahan and you now, and, and, you know, just beginning to open up that can of worms. It is, it's amazing how little is known about this and how much we really need to spread the word and get that out there and bring up the uh, inner uterine um, exposure or breast milk exposure. I think that's where initially I was exposed in an old home when I was pregnant with my daughter. She's now 22. And we've been dealing with this since, you know, uh, like I say, over 16 years now, it seems like we've been dealing with this and, and for it her almost lifelong. Long. Crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, but that's crazy. <laughs> so, yeah. I, and I and it's hard to know if your daughter, you know, obviously the mold doesn't cross the placenta, the mycotoxins. The mycotoxins, can. of course. Yes. It was also born into exposure. So who knows if it was from, you know, you gotcha. and the placenta or if that just her own exposure from the house. Right. And then the other, the interesting thing is only about a quarter of the population is sensitive to mold. So mm. it can be sometimes that a mom has mold sick, but the kid's not even sensitive. Gotcha. Um, anyways, it shouldn't have taken you 16 years. I'm no. sorry. Hey, listen, it is what it is. And I, I always <laughs> yeah. say that these things are They're badges of honor so that I when, once I learn about it and I, I get it, you know, uh, get it learned, then I can help other people with it. And yeah, very, exactly. That's very how well. we all get into all this stuff, right? Absolutely. So in facing treatment. <clears throat> Um, naturally getting out of the exposure and, um, you know, uh, seeking therapy. Um, that is, uh, that's uh, half the, the battle, I'm sure. But how long does it take? You said it takes for about two weeks for patients to begin to feel better. But how long does it take actually for somebody to go through treatment and, and end up, can they ever say that they're cured? 100% they can right. say that they're cured. So it's there's hope. Completely treatable, which is why I enjoy doing it. Um, so it, it, it's kind of an impossible question to answer because yeah. it depends on the case of and the, the amount of mold in the system and how sick they are, how sensitive they are. So some patients, you know, are really sensitive and you have to go really, really slow with your binders and your glutathione Absolutely. and your detox or they get more sick, they get more symptomatic. So if we m- mobilize more than the body can get out in the urine, the stool and the sweat, they can feel worse. And so with those patients, you have to go real slow and they, they still continue to feel you know better, a little slower, but those patients are going to take a lot longer than somebody who can just pop full doses of binders right away and feel good and feel better. And then, you know, maybe their load isn't that high. So, you know, I would say, I would say six months minimum, but I don't even like to tell people because they, I think they always imagine that they're going to be sick for that long and like, no, 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 it's just to completely get you better, but you'll start feeling better quickly. Exactly. And so if then, you're not being exposed and then, then it's a different, bit of a different picture. Set those expectations. And two, people don't realize that there's a lot of different factors that play with that. So, you know, what is your, uh, what is your gender and, you know, your hormone status, uh, you know, your stressors, are you, you know, complicated with other diseases? In my case, yeah. I feel like it turned on a genetic, um, you know, rheumatoid arthritis. So once that gene, you know, is on and once you're battling that, it's that's something very difficult to, you know, recover from. You may have symptoms, and you know, continuously. Do you have rheumatoid arthritis? I sure do. Oh, yes, absolutely. And, and can I ask, was it like 
you know, do you have the anti-CCP antibodies? Was it was it a soft call, like sort of you fits rheumatoid arthritis? Or where, was he like, you 100% have it? I, I, t- I was positive. I did have rheumatoid factor. I did not have anti-CCP antibodies. So didn't hmm. appear to be, um, you know, uh, kind of strongly positive in that aspect. But I did have positive rheumatoid factor. You know, ESR, CRP, I had all of the touch points oh, on there. Elevated, you know. yeah. Yeah, okay. so we... It, <laughs> I still want to sit on it as a soft call. It's not rampant in my family, but uh, there are some remote cases of it. My daughter exhibits mm-hmm. the exact same symptoms. Uh, she has not really wow. tested positive yet, but um, but okay. it, yeah. So, so I always oh. sort of hope with a rheumatoid arthritis diagnosis that it is actually underlying mold or underlying mm-hmm. Lyme or both because they're treatable. Yeah. Um, and I've seen all of the above, like some people that get kind of a soft call for MS or rheumatoid arthritis, and it turns out to be mold or Lyme and you treat them and it all goes away. Right. And then I have patients that have both. They have like RA and they have mold and, sure. or, or Lyme and the mold makes it a lot worse. So at least the mold is treatable. And then often the RA also gets significantly better. Absolutely. And that's what, that's always the hope. I've been held out hope for, you know, a very long time that I could get better from this. I'm hyper focused on my daughter at this point. What about psychological symptoms? Do people get a lot of, you know, uh, psychological symptoms? Can they can it precipitate a mood disorder? Can they have maybe an encephalopathy of sorts? Or what do you notice yeah. psychologically for people? A lot of neuropsych symptoms. So the most common symptoms would be fatigue, brain fog, mm-hmm. um, ha- headaches and migraines, insomnia, anxiety, sometimes depression, sometimes suicidality. Okay. Kids will get have more neuropsych stuff. So they might get OCD all of a sudden, or they might get um, a new tick or, you know, um, other, they can get ADHD, ADHD. really easily from it and, you know, other behavioral stuff. But yeah, there's, there's quite a few um, mood or neuropsych uh, it's usually, you know, somebody will say like, I just never had right. anxiety. And then suddenly I just had panic attacks all the time and I felt suicidal and I couldn't sleep and I had migraines. And, and then, you know, the other main symptom is, is just weird neurologic symptoms that don't fit into any like the neurologic diagnoses. Right. So, you know, numbness that comes and goes or muscle fasciculations, the little muscle twitches and voluntary twitches, but all over their body. Right. Or, <clears throat> I had somebody who was diagnosed with basal or migraines, which isn't really mm-hmm. a real diagnosis. Like exactly. <laughs> it was mold right. and she got 100% better. And yeah, right. so a lot of, you know, whenever there's a real funky like neurologic presentation with some of those other things, I suspect mold. When it doesn't make sense, it's probably mold. So that's right. that's, <laughs> that's kind of what my my saying is. Yeah. So, well, we have talked ourselves all the way up to the uh, break here. And so I'll probably uh, talk a little bit about my sponsors on the other side, but we are going to come back in just a minute. I'm going to let you open up and tell people where they can find you and more information. I'm going to have all of that on my website. So drpbetterlife.com. When this airs coming up next week, there's going to be a lot of information there for you. We are with Dr. Terry Fox. Going to take a break. Be right back. Fatty liver is linked to two different situations, alcohol and diabetes or obesity. In both cases, patients can have no symptoms. In the United States and in particular, Texas, the most common cause of liver disease in general is non-alcoholic fatty liver. Again, associated with overweight, obesity, and or diabetes. Additional risk factors include high cholesterol, high blood pressure, Hispanic ethnicity, and postmenopausal status. At Pinnacle Clinical Research, we offer a quick, non-invasive, ultrasound-based screening assessment called FibroScan. This test is done at no cost to you, and we do not take insurance. The test will measure the fat and stiffness in your liver and state your risk and development of fatty liver disease. You will meet with a provider immediately following your scan to go over your results. If you're interested in getting more information on your liver health, please call 210-529-7978 and schedule your FibroScan today. We are conveniently located in the Medical Center at 5109 Medical Drive. 
Depression, anxiety, low energy, weakness, these are just some symptoms of low B12 levels. And the absorbable B12 folate supplement that's helping people declare victory over depression symptoms is De Novo Plus B12 by Magna Pharmaceuticals. Patients with symptoms of depression often exhibit low levels of folate and vitamin B12. The human body needs sufficient folate intake to produce the essential neurotransmitters serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. These neurotransmitters alleviate feelings of sadness and anxiety, and gloom. What makes De Novo Plus B12 so successful? De Novo Plus B12 contains readily absorbable folate and B12. That means it's more successful at correcting the root cause of your deficiency, not just the symptoms. Whether you are suffering with low energy, depression, fatigue, or anxiety, you owe it to yourself to learn more at magnaweb.com. That's magnaweb.com. Please let us know at checkout that you heard about De Novo Plus B12 on The Better Life with Dr. Pinkston. Welcome back to The Better Life with Dr. Pinkston. I'm Dr. Marianne Pinkston, and here with Dr. Terry Fox from Boulder Holistic uh, Medicine, who we are talking about mold toxicity, which I have had several times on, uh, highlighted several times on the show, but I wanted to highlight this one uh, specifically because really we're talking more about the aspects of getting diagnosed, getting treatment, and uh, what you can can really do, a hands-on show, and I love that. So I do need to say really quickly, since we didn't before we ended, that I do have two great sponsors that uh, are helping me. So Pinnacle Clinical Research, uh, Pinnacle Research Texas. You can go to PinnacleResearchTexas.com and get your free fibro scan looking for fatty liver disease, which Dr. Fox is huge here in South Texas. So um, also to Magna Pharmaceuticals, my new sponsor, who is um, my methylphobia, Folate donor. I love these guys. They have been uh, taking care of me with my MTHFR, which I've talked about on the show, and getting methylfolate so that folks can get their brain back and feel a lot better, which I'm sure has a little role in mold toxicity, uh, MTHFR. But let's, uh, and I know I want people to know where to find you. We didn't talk about that beforehand. Where can patients look you up and get more information? Um, yeah, boulderholistic.com is my website. Um, we've got tons of blogs and uh, lots of information on there for people. Great. I, I will have all of that highlighted as well on my website, especially where to look for people local to you that actually can help you get this diagnosed and treated. So uh, go to drpbetterlife.com. That's where all my information is, and I will definitely highlight Dr. Fox here. So let's uh, open up a little bit about treatment. What is it? And I know you've got an offer, too, that you're going to give for patients who kind of want to get started, but uh, how do people look and get uh, get treatment from here on out? I do it in um, a two parts. So like I was saying, the people that get sick from mold are the ones that can't detoxify it or metabolize it or get it out of the system on their own. And so it's a lot of um, just detox, but it's specific to the different mycotoxins. So the different mycotoxins, those are the toxins that mold secrete that are pathogenic in humans. They each have different um, affinities for different binders. So once you know, you know what you're working with, then for example, you know, trichothecenes are a really pathogenic disease causing nerve toxin that that comes from black mold and um, that one the best uh, binder is activated charcoal mm -hmm. and then some of the other ones need betonite clay and some of the other ones need cholestyramine and so the binders basically just bind mycotoxins and neurotoxins that mold secrete sometimes it could bind a little bit of mold in the GI tract and pull it out in the stool they don't get absorbed into the system okay. and then you do um, glutathione in a big decent dose and that will help you metabolize it so you can get it out in the urine, the stool, and the sweat. So it's real common for mold patients to have SNPs in their ability to produce and to transfer glutathione. It's really common to have the MTHFR right. mutation. I don't think any of my mold patients don't have one. And I, I there's got to be some methylation that, well, there is methylation that's part of detoxifying mold as well. Right. Um, 
And so, yeah, so the first part, I do a nasal spray, a compounded nasal spray with um, an antifungal and something for biofilm because if it is colonized in the system or it's made a home, it's most commonly up here in the sinuses. So we're trying to just get a little bit locally. And then when the you get somebody on full doses of binders and they're feeling good and so binders are constipating and they have to work with magnesium to, you know, or whatever else works for them to make sure that they're having complete daily movements. Cause you can imagine if yeah. it's just bleeding in the stool and pulling it out, but you have an incomplete evacuation, <laughs> it just recirculates and you don't really get anywhere that day. So it's important to get that whole dance figured out with the, you know, the magnesium and the, and the binders and the glutathione and be up to speed. And then when they've been on all that for about a month, I'll start phase two, which is antifungal medications, which kill any remaining colonized mold in the system. And then, then we move on to biofilm, which I don't know if you want me to explain biofilm. (laughs) Biofilm. I just figured out that I have that. So uh, we've got about uh, about (laughs) two minutes left. So yeah, what is biofilm? Imagine you're uh, sleeping in a home with mold and eventually you, you know, you're sleeping and you breathe a spore up into your nose, into your upper respiratory tract, or you swallow one down your esophagus into your GI tract. It can stick and then replicate and then create families and communities and they aggregate together and they form a colony and then they secrete this like gly- glycoprotein matrix around them and that protects them from your immune system and from our antifungal agents and herbs and all of that. And so eventually, if you don't get through the biofilm, you won't get rid of all of it. Right. But it's it's uh, this is where like you need guidance because if you start with biofilm, then you're opening it up and just releasing more of the stuff that's already making them sick. So it sort of has to come in at the right point yeah. Um, where the body's like now, you know, pulling out the mycotoxins with the binders and everything well. And, and then they do great. They do great at each, you know, different stage. So the great point here is don't take this on yourself and skip steps. It is a process just like anything in medicine is a process where you need to know what you're doing before you do it and reading on Google and you know all those that I know people need information or hungry for information, but there are steps that people need to take in a process that you need to go through. So be careful. There's a yeah. lot of people out there who are taking advantage of, of the you know uh, mold community, the people who are sick from mold and selling you a lot of things. So you know just be very, very careful about where you get your information. And that's why that we're doing this today, because I really do want people to understand that there is hope, there is treatment, there is there are doctors and, and professionals who do believe you out there and are willing to help you get started. And I'm so thankful that you have been on today. Uh, great information, a lot of great hands-on information, not just scientific uh, uh, scientific shuffle here. Of, of uh, I definitely know people can find some help now, how to get tested, how to find uh, somebody to support them through this process. Very, very important because it can make you very sick and it can disrupt your life uh, incredibly. It has mine, it has my daughter's. So uh, one more time, where can people find you? Um, so boulderholistic.com is my website. It's a, there's a wealth of information there. If you sign up for the newsletter, we put out, you know, several blogs a month and several emails on different topics, a lot of them mold related, um, but all functional medicine stuff. Yes. And we have, um, you know, a little bit of a social media presence, but not a ton. You probably get more out of the website. Good. All right. Well, I will have people go that direction. So again, you can find all of my previous shows and my information blogs, all of that at drpbetterlife.com. And I will definitely highlight everything that you have. I appreciate you greatly. Again, I know you're going to have an offer for folks, so we will have that posted as well. I appreciate that. And uh, 15% off on some of your products and some of your services, which is wonderful. I was going to do two of my favorite binders, a bentonite clay and an activated charcoal one, and then um, a couple different forms of glutathione. I love it. Thank you. Glutathione is wonderful. The master antioxidant. All right, guys, we are out of time. Dr. Fox, thank you so much. It's been an honor. And uh, we will see you guys. Thank you. And we'll see you guys next time. Thank you for having me. You're welcome, dear. We'll see you soon.